Why are home prices still going up? What's the real problem? I'm going to show you why homes are becoming so unaffordable in the US. I'll go over what's really killing the housing market, and I'm gonna take it all the way back to the source of the evil in this country that's creating a bubble in absolutely everything. By the end, you'll understand the one key truth that only one in a million people actually comprehend so that with eyes wide open, you can see the reality and prepare yourself for the turmoil to come. I'm gonna take you on a little journey today and it's mental. It requires your full concentration. So if you can't give that, don't even bother watching the rest of the video. Just click away now. It's a waste of your time. Okay, for everyone still here, grab a cup of coffee or whatever and let's go down the rabbit hole. This all started one day as I was innocently perusing my YouTube feed and I saw this video. Is corporate greed crushing the housing market? It was a compelling question, so I clicked. Now, I've never met Michael, but I have run across his channel before and he seems like a guy who knows his stuff in the real estate space. So I watched and I'll put a link to this video below. Michael's thesis is that investors are ruining the housing market for the average Joe, buying up inventory with cash, and that we need to do something about it. With Redfin reporting that 18.4% of homes in Q4 2021 were purchased by investors, which is up 12.6% from the year prior, yeah, this does raise an eyebrow. But more alarmingly, if you live in Atlanta, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Las Vegas, or Phoenix, investors bought roughly one-third of all the houses available in those markets mostly in the lower to mid price ranges. So if you're a regular buyer trying to break into one of these markets, competing with corporations who pay all cash, yeah, it's a real problem. As one commenter aptly put it, houses aren't casino chips, they're shelter for human beings. And as Michael put it, do we really wanna live in an America that values corporations over people? This was an interesting opening to the affordability problem from the point of view of normal people experiencing symptoms of the real problem. The comments under this video are pure gold and one did go deeper pointing back to the source, but the video itself didn't go there. So regular people trying to buy a house are suffering because everything's expensive, prices keep going up and big corporations are crowding them out of the housing market buying up our very limited inventory for cash. But why is this happening? Hold that thought, we'll get back to it in a minute. So right after I watched Michael's video, I saw this thumbnail and thought, surely this will get to the root of our housing affordability problem. Now I've never met Sorrel either, but I like her because she's a fresh, female voice in the personal finance niche. She's well-researched and she's someone who made it big as an influencer and is legit trying to figure out how to protect and grow her hard-won nest egg. The best thing about her though is that she's taken the red pill, which means she understands the insidious scam that I'm about to show you. So, I recommend watching this one too, and I'll link it below. This was a well-produced video that laid out the case for the idea that we're on the verge of an economic crisis that your government doesn't want you to think about. She takes us through the history of the US dollar going off the gold standard and the inflation that followed. Then she shows us how the real inflation rate has been manipulated and hidden from us for decades. She brings housing into it as a deliberate omission in the deception, but she doesn't go any further than that. She wraps up discussing the risks of hyperinflation and what you can do to prepare. Now, that's all great information and you should definitely watch the video, but it still doesn't address the root of the problem. Why would governments want to hide the truth about inflation? Why are corporations buying so many houses? They didn't used to. And where is all that cash coming from? Let me tell you, this goes way beyond supply and demand. To get to the root of all our economic problems, we have to follow the money to the source. Can you guess where I'm going with this? Let me know in the comments below. Deeper into the rabbit hole, my friends. This is where you really need to focus. Before we go any further, we need to understand what is money. This is a very important foundational concept. Simply put, money is a store of value that can be exchanged for goods and services. Many things have been used as money by humans over the centuries. Shells, beads, cows, amber, 
copper, silver, gold, paper notes, and most recently, computer bytes. Money systems have come and gone, but the most successful share three characteristics. Number one, money must be a stable store of value, meaning that its value today will be pretty much the same as next week, next month, next year, and beyond. Gold, silver, and copper have been historically good as money since they're rare, they take a lot of effort to mine, and they don't corrode or rust over time. Number two, money needs to be widely accepted by the majority of people as a medium of exchange, which means people need to trust it as a store of value. Number three, money needs to be a unit of account, meaning that you can divide it and each unit is equivalent. So one dollar equals one unit and every other dollar is identical and it can be further divided into cents. This is where diamonds, cows, beads, and shells fall down. They're not perfectly equivalent or divisible. Boiling it down further, money is simply a claim on human labor because everything we can buy with it is either a service done by people, a product made by people, or a right sold by people. Okay, now that we understand what money is, let's look at the bigger picture. Have you ever stood at the bottom of a huge mountain and looked up? You'll always see something that looks like the top, where rocks meet the sky, but if you actually start climbing, when you reach that spot, you'll see that it's not the top. Sure, when you get there, the view is better and you can see more, but you don't have the whole picture. So you look up, you see a new top, you climb, you get there, but it's still not the real top. Each time you do this, the view gets better, but you have to keep climbing to get to the real top to see the entire view and to know what's really going on in 360 degrees all around you. That's our money system. It's like a great big pyramid of a mountain with a bottom that's ever expanding, which we'll explain as I get further in. But you and I are standing at today's bottom where we can't see the whole picture when we look up. So we have no idea what's really going on up there. So let's fly to the top to see what's up there and work our way down. Because once you see how our money system works from the top, each step of the way down this huge mountain you will begin to understand the source of everything that's wrong with our economy today, including why the price of everything, including houses, keeps going up and why it can never stop. It all starts with the US federal government who has the power to issue and control money in our country as set forth in the Constitution. Now in 1913, our government outsourced this function to the Federal Reserve System, which serves as our central bank. Arguably the most powerful financial institution in the world, it's organized as 12 regional semi-independent Federal Reserve Banks located in major cities across the US and set up as private corporations. Who owns these corporations isn't entirely clear due to a number of mergers and acquisitions over the years, but they are essentially owned by commercial banks. Now these member banks hold stock in these Federal Reserve Banks and they earn dividends on the profits. These 12 private profitable corporations are overseen by the Board of Governors, an agency of the federal government who report to and are directly accountable to Congress. Known simply as the Fed, Jerome Powell is the current chairman and head spokesperson for this group. The Fed's stated primary goal is to influence monetary and credit conditions in the U.S. economy to ensure maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates, with a debatable track record on all fronts. So at the top of our money mountain, we have these two institutions, one filled with bankers and one filled with politicians. Money creation begins with politicians who want to fund programs because there is no better way to stay in office than to hand out free stuff. So they authorize an amount and tell the U.S. Treasury to create some bonds for this amount. I need some bonds. What are bonds, you ask? Bonds are nothing more than government IOUs, as in IOU money with interest payments periodically paid, think of it as the price to rent money, and maturity dates where the principal, which is the entire original amount, must be paid back. These treasury bonds are our national debt and they're meant to be paid back by the American taxpayer you, me, and all our descendants. So let's go down the mountain a bit. The treasury holds a bond auction and the primary dealers, new characters, show up to bid. 
A primary dealer is a bank or other financial institution that has been approved to trade securities with a national government, and it is a very exclusive club with only 24 members as of 2019. These dealers buy U.S. Treasury bonds to make a profit by earning interest, which is pretty much a risk-free income stream guaranteed by Uncle Sam. And then through a process known as open market operations, the banks turn around and sell some of these bonds to the Federal Reserve. Reserve. Now, stick with me here because this is the root of all evil, where the deception really begins. The Federal Reserve buys these bonds from the primary dealers, writing checks from an account with no money in it. Got that? It's simply recorded by computer keystroke. It's not backed by gold or silver or anything at all. There's nothing there. So dollars are created from thin air and added to the money supply. The primary dealers take the proceeds from the sale, these newly created dollars, and put them to use buying more bonds, making a profit every time they sell back to the Federal Reserve. It's literally like that game, Farmville on Facebook, where you plant some electronic corn, and a few hours later you get to reap some electronic gold coins, only this is real life. They're getting real money that they can spend on stuff, just by going through the motions. It's a pretty awesome gig. So the treasury is creating IOUs in the form of bonds, and the Federal Reserve is creating IOUs in the form of dollars. And all they do is swap IOUs using the primary dealers as middlemen to create dollars out of thin air to pump into the economy to keep the growth machine going. Done over and over again, this enriches the banks and the government while increasing the public debt that we, the people, and our children and grandchildren are on the hook to pay back, which is mathematically impossible at this point, which is another video for another day. So at the top of our mountain, the Federal Reserve is collecting bonds and the Treasury is collecting dollars. Okay, so a little further down, the Treasury moves these dollars to the various government agencies per the U.S. budget approved by Congress. These agencies use these fresh dollars to pay for military, infrastructure, and social programs. People getting paychecks from these activities, like government employees, contractors, and program beneficiaries, deposit these funds into banks. Now stick with me here because if you think the Federal Reserve writing blank checks is bad, wait till you see what every bank nationwide does legally that exponentially makes everything worse. When you deposit your paycheck into a bank, they don't keep those funds in trust for you dollar for dollar. You are in reality loaning them your dollars, which they can use within certain legal limits in a whole bunch of ways, like investing in the stock market, or loaning them out to other people for a profit. Now, this is where serious currency creation comes into play, 92 to 95% of it, in fact. Through the incredible privilege of fractional reserve lending, banks are only required to keep some portion of your deposit, let's say 10%, for example, and they are free to lend out the rest. Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, but walk with me through the example to understand just how quickly this can get out of hand on an exponential scale. So if you deposit a thousand bucks, the bank gives you a receipt. If their reserve requirement is 10% and these vary depending on what the Federal Reserve mandates, they'll keep $100 of your deposit as vault cash and lend out the other $900 with interest. Now pay attention, this is the important part. When they take your $900 and lend it out to other people, they give you a $900 bank credit. So when you look at your statement, you'll see $1,000 as expected, all good. The bank credits are where money is created and added to the system in a behind the scenes notation that nobody ever thinks about. These are essentially IOUs. So now there's $1,900 in existence just like that. So let's take a look at the people borrowing 900 bucks. They take those dollars and pay a guy to refinish a floor in their house. Floor guy deposits that money into his bank account. The bank keeps 90 bucks cash, issues an $810 bank credit, and lends that $810 to another guy who needs it to buy a new TV. 
The store deposits that $810 at their bank, who keeps $81 in cash, issues the store a $729 bank credit, and lends that $729 to another guy who needs to buy a lawnmower. So with just these three examples, $2,339 has been created out of thin air and injected into the economy, all backed by $234.90 of vault cash, which is nothing more than 234.9 IOUs from the government, which the taxpayers of the United States of America are expected to pay back, even though our debt is so large that it's mathematically impossible to ever pay back. Our whole monetary system is a scam based on currency backed by nothing, and the value of each new dollar created by the Federal Reserve System diminishes the value of every other dollar in existence. It's why Uno bars that were 10 cents when I was a kid are now $1.50 today. Oh my god, so good. That's my favorite candy bar. This inflation of the money supply is a hidden tax manifested by the realization that each year your so-called money seems to buy less and less. And the truth is, while it's easy to blame greedy entrepreneurs or selfish landlords or evil corporations for raising prices, they're often forced to due to rising input costs as more IOU dollars chase after a finite supply of real things. And COVID, with its supply chain disruptions and stimulus checks, absolutely intensified the issue. More people with more dollars buying limited things equals higher prices, housing included. Yet despite the current inflation spike, the Federal Reserve has done a pretty good job of keeping the dollar as global reserve currency fairly steady over the years compared to other currencies, but it's still a fiat currency, which means it has value merely by government decree. Dollars are not redeemable for gold or silver or anything other than promises that the US taxpayer will, yeah, We'll pay you back. Tied to nothing tangible, it's so easy to create as many new dollars as you need, and those closest to the source get to spend them first before prices go up for the rest of us plebs. Here's how it plays out in the housing market. You're a government contractor working in DC, an investment banker in New York, or a principal engineer in Silicon Valley whose company just went public. <laughs> cha -ching. You live in an expensive place, do complicated work, and you get paid extremely well because you're close to the source of the new money flows. You get your paycheck, spend it in the economy, and then your grocer, your housekeeper, your accountant, and the Irish pub down the street, they all get money from you. But let's say you've had it with corporate life and you decide to cash out and move to Knoxville or Miami or Dorado, Puerto Rico, taking your big budget with you. Homes in your new location are so much cheaper. Everything's a good deal, so your dollar goes farther. If enough folks like you make these kinds of moves in the face of limited supply, you'll drive up prices to the point where locals, who never spent any time near the big money flows, will be priced out of their own markets. In fact, Redfin recently reported that out-of-town buyers have an average 30% more to spend than locals do. And that's how price inflation is exported everywhere. The true definition of inflation is an expanding currency supply. Rising prices are merely a symptom. The thing is, you work for this currency. You trade your precious time for it, hour by hour, day by day, year after year. And the irony is that our so-called money, these dollars, are nothing more than IOUs backed by an empty checkbook, typed into a computer in a bank, and trust in the illusion that they will retain their value when it comes time to exchange them for something real. This is why the rich are becoming richer and the poor poorer. Those close to the spigot, the rich, get more and can do more, while those furthest away, the poor, get less and can do less. So the economic divide continues to widen until at some point the whole thing collapses under its own weight because nothing grows exponentially forever in a finite environment and this is the hardest concept for people to grasp.
There's actually a lot more to this story, so I highly recommend that you watch Mike Maloney's Hidden Secrets of Money series, where he explains in detail how our corrupt monetary system, which must grow or die, will inevitably collapse and why. He uses a lot of animations to illustrate concepts that make it really easy to follow, so I'll put a link in the description below. Another source I highly recommend to understand our current predicament is Chris Martinson's free tutorial, The Crash Course. There, he examines the data and connects the dots from several different disciplines, looking at how energy, the environment, and the economy will together determine the future of humanity? Absolutely! If you care about the human species, check out his work, link below. And by the way, I have no affiliation with either of these gentlemen other than as a customer of their products and an admirer of their work. So what do you think about all this? Does it make sense? Do you see why the price of everything keeps going up? Do you understand why our actual money is the source of the problem? And what else do you wanna know? Tell me in the comments, I'd love to hear what you think. And by the way, if you need a good realtor, we're happy to recommend one. Click the link below to connect. So thanks for coming down the rabbit hole with me today. If you wanna know more about the housing market, check out this video here. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. She'll never know.